Politicians always say, follow the science. We here have the nation's best known geologist, a highly qualified, internationally respected scientist who knows more about climate science than any politician. Welcome, uh, Professor Ian Plymer. Well, thank you for that welcome, but it's not really a, a, a something to boast about, knowing more than a politician. <laughs> Yes, I suppose I left myself open there. Well, I have a couple of particular questions, if I may. Uh, the Bureau of Meteorology predicted that this winter would be warm and dry. Well, from where I am, it seems to me, uh, over my long life, that this in Sydney is the coldest and wettest of winters I can remember. How is it that they can make such a poor prediction, yet uh, uh, they're predicting a few decades hence the, the world temperature to a fraction of a degree. How can they seriously do that? Is, is, there, any, is there any truth in their ability to predict the, the weather as it will be, the climate as it will be, the temperatures as it will be some decades hence? Well, I come to you from Adelaide, where it's quite cold and wet, and it has been for quite some time. And some while ago, I said to my wife that last summer would be a cool summer, and I was right. I also said that we're going to have a cool, wet winter, and I was right. Now, I do that looking at cycles of climate. The Bureau of Meteorology have $20 million computers, and they feed it in all sorts of information, and then make a weather prediction. Now, you wouldn't want to rely on the Bureau of Meteorology if you were a farmer. There are quite a few other groups out there that charge but provide much more accurate weather predictions, and farmers are now turning to use these. So they have managed to monumentally get this wrong, and this is not the first time. And as for making predictions on the future, a long time out in the future, then you really have to roll your eyes because it is just not possible to make long-term predictions when you only have a fraction of the information. The second thing is that their models for making predictions for long-term climate are based on carbon dioxide being a driver of climate. Some of the other models, such as the Russian models, where they don't use carbon dioxide as a driver, are much, much better at predicting what will happen. So we can test their predictions, and we've had 30 years of climate predictions. We can then look at what's happened over the last 30 years, and we see that all the climate predictions warm the climate. Uh, they're not related to reality at all. So we have a problem when we use massive supercomputers to try to predict the weather and to try to predict climate. And time and time again, the Bureau of Meteorology shows that. Now, they cost us a million dollars a day and I would have thought that that could be better spent getting the weather right and forgetting about climate. Just tell us if we're going to have a wet winter. Do we put in a crop? Do we not put in a crop? Tell us if we're going to have a drought and how long the drought's going to last. This has profound economic implications for farmers in Australia. So it's quite disappointing that an organisation that governments rely on and that farmers rely on get it wrong. Well, that, that's, that's important, isn't it? So there are a number of factors, obviously, which apparently affect the climate. Was, is that correct? There's a, a very large number of factors, and one of them is not carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has no effect on long-term climate. We know that from looking in the geological past. We've had times in the past when there's been 500 times more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. And yet we had massive ice ages and not runaway global warming, as we are being told. So the evidence doesn't stack up. For long-term climate, there are many drivers, and these are uh, tectonic drivers, galactic drivers, orbital drivers, um, solar drivers, and we now have found a, a Martian driver to climate, and um, a lunar driver, which is the lunar tidal node, which pushes warm water into the Arctic and opens up the Northwest Passage every 18.6 years. So we know the cycles. We don't know exactly um, how they work, but we have enough information to be able to look at long-term climate cycles, which um, are the same as the past climate cycles. So if you're going to make 
predictions based on the climate, uh, you, you have to use the past, and this is not being done. Now, I bought your little green book, and you're very kind because you have uh, three versions, depending on your age, and I bought the one for adults and, as you say, wrinklies, and I found there an interesting observation. You say that Australia is already at net zero, and that stri struck me as rather interesting because almost all of the politicians seem to have some sort of target, and they're fighting about different targets, about attaining net zero or getting to net zero, but you could tell them, if they listened to you, you'd be able to tell them not to worry, we're already at net zero. Could you explain what that's well, about? Those three little books, uh, the first one was written for uh, children 8 to 12, and that basically deals with bodily functions and the carbon cycle and how we eat carbon foods and we release carbon. And I concentrate on something that little boys and little girls laugh about, and that's farting. The second book is for teenagers, and teenagers will complain. You know, they're, 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 things are not fair. And I say, well, is it fair that... Children as slaves working in the Congo are uh, creating cobalt such as you can live using modern electronic instruments. Is that fair? And then I go into some of the arguments that teenage kids will use, saying, oh, you know, this is the hottest time ever. Well, no, this is not the case. Um, let's look back in the past. So we've got more tornadoes and hurricanes and cyclones that we've had ever. No, it's the exact opposite. Or oh, we've got more forest fires now. No, it's the exact opposite. So I, I dispel some of the myths. And the third book to which you refer is a book written um, basically summarising the state of knowledge of climate. And the whole concept of net zero is asinine. In this country, we emit carbon dioxide from industry. And the attack on carbon dioxide is an attack on civilization. It's an attack on industry. It's got nothing to do with climate or the environment. And so we release carbon dioxide by burning coal, by burning oil, by burning uh, petroleum products. Uh, we release carbon dioxide by making cement, uh, one of the pillars of modern society. And you can actually calculate how much carbon dioxide we release. And then we absorb carbon dioxide. And in this country, we absorb carbon dioxide into soils. And we can calculate how much is absorbed by the soils into grasslands, into rangelands, into crops, into forests. And you can do the calculation to show that we absorb more carbon dioxide than we emit. And then if you add to that our continental shelf, where we have a huge sucking up of carbon dioxide into our colder waters and carbon dioxide dissolved in water being used to make coral in more northern areas, then it's a huge difference. There's about 10 times as much carbon dioxide that we absorb than we release. So we are already at net zero. We're already sequestering more carbon dioxide than we release from our modern world. So the whole concept of net zero is, has got nothing to do with balancing out what happens to carbon dioxide. It is an attack on industry. It's an attack on society. It's especially an attack on farmers. And it's an attack on everything that gives us our modern, comfortable life. And uh, what, what you're really saying is it's uh, silly to be aiming for net zero. In fact, it's, it's very bad from the point of view of the economy. And anyway, we've got net zero. We're producing... We're, we're in a situation where we have achieved net zero. Well, yes, uh, it's impossible to achieve net zero because you would die. Um, humans uh, rely on carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not a pollutant, it is plant food. And the plants use the carbon dioxide together with water and, and sunlight to make cellulose, to make sugars and to grow. And um, the whole of the animal kingdom depends upon the plant world. So if we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide, then we're reducing the amount of carbon dioxide the plants have available. Now, that reduction of carbon dioxide has been going on ever since we had complex organisms on planet Earth, and that's for the last 600 million years. And 600 million 
years ago, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere was 0.7%. It is now 0.04%. It's been going down because we've been sequestering carbon dioxide into limestone, into limey uh, shells of, um, of animals, into, into sediments, then later into plants, uh, and we've had this constant sequestering of carbon dioxide. And the problem with carbon dioxide is that we are dangerously low. If we halved the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we would have plant life die, and then animal life would die. So it's completely asinine to try to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If we were truly caring for the environment, we would be putting as much carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere from where it originally resided. And to do this, um, we, we need to understand how coal forms or how petroleum forms. And basically that petroleum and coal form by a cycle of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, putting it into uh, life, uh, preserving that life, and then later oxidising that life, uh, by burning it as a fossil fuel and putting the carbon dioxide back in the atmosphere. So we really have gone completely down the wrong track in trying to uh, destroy the foundations of civilization, um, which depends upon carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is related to the production of everything we use in the modern world, steel, cement, fertilizers, plastics, these define the modern world. And if we didn't release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we would have no modern world. So the attack on carbon dioxide is definitely not an attack trying to change the climate because uh, people have shown time and time and time again, the very small amount of carbon dioxide that we release in this country that goes into the atmosphere is three parts to five fifths of absolutely nothing. So it doesn't affect the climate. Uh, people have shown many, many times that carbon dioxide doesn't drive global warming. So we're attacking the wrong beast. We see now countries are spending trillions of dollars to reduce carbon dioxide to approach net zero. It is the impossible dream. It's the dream of ideolo ideologues. It's the dream of those who are trying to destroy an industrialised society. Professor Ian Blamer, thank you again for continuing the fight for the truth. And eventually that will, I'm sure, prevail across the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.